Well, welcome everyone. Uh, so, I usually avoid, you know, pure SharePoint conferences. And though I will be at the European SharePoint conference, but I usually avoid that. It's always interesting to go to a, a regular dev conference and talk about SharePoint. And uh, it's, it's good to see the interest in SharePoint, but then the downside of that is there's usually fewer number of people interested in SharePoint. So, I am absolutely thrilled to see the level of interest in SharePoint at this conference. Like a lot of people have been attending different sessions. I have uh, uh, over here. I have I had a pre-call workshop, which was a developers overview. Then I had uh, another session uh, on Tuesday, which talked about just starting up with SharePoint. Then I had one this morning in which I talked about security trimming search. I see some of you were in there. Um, and uh, luckily all the demos worked, but that was a relatively complicated uh, session to pull off, so that was good. This session I'm going to talk about SharePoint apps, which is the new change in SharePoint 2013. And then there have another session after lunch, which is about CSOM and REST API. And then tomorrow I have a full post-con workshop, which is to do with SharePoint apps. So any of us attended my pre-con, the first day over here? Okay, you did. And anybody planning on attending the post-con? Okay, so you can see this as a, uh, apps is like a zoomed in version of one part of the pre-con, and this is a quick preview of that. Uh, obviously, apps is a big topic. If we have a whole day post-con on it, then obviously we cannot cover all the details in 90 minutes. So I'll start with some introductions. My name is Sahil Malik. I live in Washington, D.C. I run a small company out of there. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we offer high-end uh, specialized skills on Microsoft and iOS platforms. And we have clients all the way from Singapore to California, all across the world. Uh, currently, actively right now, we're working in seven different countries. Uh, this session is about SharePoint apps, which is the biggest difference between SharePoint 2013 and, 20, uh, and 2010. Uh, SharePoint Apps uh, was created to solve a big problem, which is prior to SharePoint 2013, we used to write code that ran inside SharePoint. And SharePoint API is a total bank. It's, it's complicated. It, there's a learning curve, and some of the things in it may not be very obvious and may not be very clean. Sometimes it feels like a sausage factory. So to keep developers out of that mess, because when you're working inside that mess, you're less productive. You need a powerful machine to develop on, and you have to learn that API. And most of all, when many of us are working with each other, then you know my code may break your code. And that's a common problem we ran into with SharePoint 2010 and 2007. We used to deploy farm solutions, and with farm solutions, they're extremely powerful, but that's also their problem. So then they came up with sandbox code, which was less powerful, but then that was a problem that we couldn't do anything with, right? Now, theoretically speaking, you could do a lot in sandbox solutions, but you had to be very crafty, right? So it's not that sandbox solutions are completely useless. So, there's like some guidance or rumors saying that sandbox solutions are deprecated. That's actually not true. What we'll see shortly is that even the apps framework uses sandbox solutions. What's deprecated is user code. Sandbox solutions that have DLLs in them, have C sharp code inside them. That's deprecated. But if you write your stuff in pure JavaScript or declarative, that's okay. That's still okay to use. That's not deprecated. So as I said, some of these slides will be a little bit of a repeat, but it's good to set some background because many of us are new. We're at a fork in the road right now. Microsoft is pushing a lot of its products to the cloud, and not just Microsoft. And there's a reason why they're doing this. Like products like Windows Intune is a cloud-only version of it. Right? The next version of Dynamics will be cloud-only. And even with SharePoint, it is pretty clear that they are moving towards the cloud. They released Office 365 with SharePoint 2010. They have improved it a lot in SharePoint 2013. They promised us that next year we will have a version of SharePoint 2015 also on premises. But really, what's happening is that the on premises versions are getting very incremental changes. Most of the changes are pushing you to the cloud. Like SharePoint 2013 Service Pack 1 
adds a section circular administration for YAML integration. There is no on-premises YAML, it's cloud only, right? So they are pushing us to the cloud and there are a lot of reasons for it. They can deliver us more complex functionality, compelling functionality quicker. There's less setup for us and obviously costs, right? A lot of reasons why they're pushing us to the cloud. Cloud is unavoidable, right? We cannot avoid cloud, but it creates some unique challenges. Notably, in SharePoint, I will never be able to deploy a form solution to Office 365. It's just not going to happen, ever, right? And they needed to give us a new development model to support them. Now, when they released Office 365 in the SharePoint 2010 timeframe, they, they thought that the solution would be sandboxed code. And that was okay, but obviously there were limitations with that. But then there was this another company called Facebook. Right? And Facebook came up with this model in which they had this app for Farmville. I swear, if anybody else sends me a Farmville request, I will unfriend them. But Farmville would run not on Facebook servers, right? And it would run on a server outside of Facebook, but it would feel like it is working inside of Facebook. In fact, it had access to Facebook functionality, like it could write on your timeline, right? So a new protocol was coming into effect, and that was called OAuth, in which the app would be trusted inside of SharePoint or Facebook in that case, and the app would have certain rights inside of Facebook or SharePoint. So in Facebook, let's say if I want to CNN.com, if I leave a comment, they give me an option, say sign in using your Facebook identity. And they gave me these check boxes in which to say, CNN.com will now have the ability to, uh, you know, <clears throat> access your basic information, uh, write to your wall, write to your friend's walls, read your status when you're not offline, draw the blood of your firstborn. Okay, you know, that's what we do. And then we say, Obama sucks, enter. Right, so that's what we do, right? So one of the challenges we're running into these days with security is that people are uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, granting access to Facebook for all sorts of stuff. So let me actually quickly show you, you know, how this works in Facebook. And the same thing is being extended to SharePoint. Is that at Facebook, over here, go to see more settings. And you'll see here that under apps, I have certain apps that already have access to my Facebook profile. And then, say, example, if I look at IFTTT, you know, it has access to my basic info, my profile info, description, activities, birthdays, education, history groups, blah, 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 my stories, friends' profiles, <coughs> stories shared with me, permission to access my data when I'm offline, your apps activity from other apps, my friends' apps activities. You know what I use it <coughs> for? To read my Facebook channels and connect it to my LinkedIn profile. That's what I use it for. Right? So this is a challenge that we're running into, and you'll see that when I talk about apps, it's a similar challenge we see with apps as well. Then you'll see there are security boundaries when you grant an app access into SharePoint, you have to decide what security rights you give it. And then you know, sometimes you may feel that, I wish I had a right in the middle of these two, but one of the things you'll see is that these rights are decided by SharePoint, the levels of rights. So typically you'll see read, write, manage, and full control. And read is read, right? Write is write. And write will allow you, allow you to write to a list, for instance, but it won't let you write a master page. Manage is pretty much useless. And then anything useful you want to do, you have to go to full control, right? So that's one of the challenges we'll run into apps, as you'll see uh, in a short way. So anyway, continuing with this, cloud is it. Apps are important. And we're probably going to go from, go from on-premises to hybrid to the cloud board. Uh, On-premises, typically when we talk of apps, we have a choice of using SharePoint hosted apps, and I'll talk about these in detail shortly. Um, SharePoint hosted apps or provider hosted apps, right? And provider hosted apps, you have a choice of doing S2S trust, in which you trust the apps that are inside of SharePoint with the help of a certificate. And what that means is that if the app server tells, that says that you are Michael Jackson, SharePoint will just assume your Michael Jackson. SharePoint will not challenge it, right? So the, the 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 setup and all that, all of that is a little bit simpler, but it's also a simpler version of OAuth. Some people call it a one-legged OAuth. When you go to hybrid, you have a choice of doing S2S, OAuth, or SharePoint hosted. 
And you'll see that a lot of new features and new uh, possibilities open up if you go with OAuth. And when you go to cloud, you have a choice of doing you know, OAuth, S2S, or SharePoint on-premises. Most probably, you'll probably just use OAuth. Going forward and all the new things that they're talking about, the new Office 365 developer APIs, that's basically some flavor or implementation of OAuth is what, what they're pushing us to. So OAuth is, is the best way for an app to be trusted inside of SharePoint. Another thing, cloud, things are changing very rapidly. Every week they push out an update, sometimes they'll update your, they'll break your stuff. So you have to keep that in mind. And some difference between SharePoint dev and Darknet dev. And the reason I bring this up is because generally developing inside of SharePoint is a lot more complex. How many of us here are SharePoint developers actively? I think it, I don't need to drive that point home that SharePoint is a complex platform that JavaScript and CSS is huge. And when we want to deliver functionality using plain Darknet, sometimes it feels easier. But we want to use SharePoint features like search, right? We want to use those features. So can we have the best of both worlds? And the answer is yes, through apps you can. You can write an app using pure, you know, .NET or MVC or you don't even have to use .NET. You can write an iPhone app using Objective-C talking to the SharePoint object model. It's possible to do that. It's platform agnostic. Truly, that'd be an app, right? So the advantage you get over there is that you now have the capability of leveraging what .NET is good for and what SharePoint is good for. And that is why they created the apps model. So your custom code that used to be inside of SharePoint, the emphasis is that they take it outside of SharePoint. And then you talk to SharePoint over a well-defined API, and that well-defined API is called as REST and CSOM. In my session after lunch, I'll be diving deeper into that. And that way you can treat your custom development as a simple .NET project. Yes, there are some things to learn about SharePoint, but you will never damage the SharePoint server, and your dev story gets a lot cleaner. You can do things easier like TDD. Yes, you can do TDD in SharePoint too, but it's just a lot, lot, lot harder. But if you go with custom .NET dev, your code is a lot simpler, Control-C, Control-V works, source control is easier, and so on and so forth. So, let's talk about SharePoint apps. So there's another flavor of apps that I'm not talking about today, which are Office apps, right? Office apps is not part of this talk. Office apps are what run inside the Office client or Office web access. I'm gonna talk only about SharePoint apps. So when I talk about SharePoint apps, basically what I'm referring to is there are various ways to slice and dice SharePoint apps. So the way I think of it when I try and digest a complicated topic, it's easier to start categorizing the picture, right? When I categorize the picture, uh, you know, it becomes an e easier to understand it. So when you look at SharePoint apps, you can categorize SharePoint apps either by user interface or how they're hosted, right? So our SharePoint app, app runs in uh, on a completely different URL. So you could just simply HTTP to that URL. And that would be a full screen app. Every app by default supports this user, user experience. Right? The app takes over the entire browser. Then you have a part app, which is a client web part, is what they call it, or some people call it an app part, which is that the app surfaces itself as a web part. Now, it doesn't have all the capabilities of SharePoint web parts. Like, you can write an editor for it, but it's very limited what you can do over there. There is no official way of doing communication between two app parts. And then you have to think of security slightly differently as well, right? So it's got some limitations. And the third is custom action. Custom action is a feature in SharePoint in which I have the ability to create links at various places in the user interface of SharePoint using custom actions. So I have the ability to create a link in the ribbon or I have the ability to create a link in site action, site settings. I have the ability to create a link in the ECB menu. So what would be a good example of a custom action uh, SharePoint app? Like, it would be nice if I could take this whole document library, like click one button, and it downloads the entire document library as a zip file, right? So I could create a custom action in the ribbon Click on that, it zips up the entire document library, downloads the file. That would be a very good example of an app. Let's think of another example. I have a list that I want to export to Excel. That would be another example. I have a Word document that with one click, I want to turn it into a PDF. 
That would be another example. With one click, I want to check it, that word document in, into another backend system. That would be another example, right? There are lots of examples that I can, you, know, you can think of in the different user interfaces you can think of. The other way to categorize SharePoint apps is based on hosting. Now, the important thing to remember over here is that when I talk of these different hosting options in apps, be it SharePoint hosted or be it server hosted, all of them can be full screen apps, part apps, or custom actions, right? So the way I'm going to introduce apps in this session, I'm going to first introduce them based on UI. But remember, as I'm introducing them based on user interface, all of those options also apply to server-hosted apps and SharePoint-hosted apps. So our SharePoint-hosted app is what runs entirely out of SharePoint. You don't need another server on the site. And what we mean by that is that you install the app, and it's served out of SharePoint. It is on a different URL, right? But the app downloads and everything in the app runs as JavaScript or client-side code. You cannot have a DLL in it. You cannot do anything possible to run code on the server in a SharePoint hosted app. So that's a big limitation of a SharePoint hosted app because by definition, a SharePoint hosted app, you have to, uh, a user has to do something for the app to be able to do something, right? They ca it cannot be a web service on the server. It cannot be a timer job that runs that does something <coughs> inside of SharePoint. That's not a choice we have in SharePoint or apps. There are other limitations also, right? We'll get to in a second. So frequently, we end up writing server-hosted apps in which our server-side code of the app runs on a separate server that is not SharePoint. Right? And that server, we could set that server up ourselves, in which it is available on a well-known URL. Right? And we would set that server up and trust it inside of SharePoint using an app package. Or the installation of the app creates a server for me in Azure. And the second choice where the installing the app creates a server is called as an auto-hosted app. And the first choice where I set up the server myself is called as a provider hosted app. Now, there are differences between these two. First of all, the biggest difference is that an auto-hosted app is something that you have to pay for, as in you're using consuming, consuming resources in Azure, so you're gonna have to pay for it. And as of today, you know, SharePoint RTM, but that's what they introduce it, but 14, 15 months later, they have not declared the prices of this yet. So some third parties have stepped in, giving us solutions for that, but as of now, we don't have a choice here. We really cannot use auto-hosted apps for production purposes as of today. Another thing to think of auto-hosted apps is that if your app got installed 50 times, you have 50 servers running in Azure, or 50 instances of your app running in Azure. And that sounds like a bad thing, but it is not such a bad thing. Because the process of packaging up your app has got enough information to set up this Azure area for you. It's all automated, so you don't have to think about it. But where it does get complicated is in two places. Number one, security. That I cannot have, like everybody gets their own partitioned view. Right? As in, if I install this app, then I get my own SQL server behind it, I get my own world. But if all of these instances needed to share some information, that gets a little challenging. It's not impossible if that shared information was anonymous, that's not a problem. I can set up a simple website or a web service and I can consume that information. But if that shared information was not anonymous, right, as in I need to authenticate you in order to keep that backend secure, then it is very hard for me to store the security ACLs of how to connect to the backend system. Like I have to come up with a creative solution to that. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. Right? That's one challenge it creates. And the second challenge auto-hosted apps create are upgrade scenarios. Because in the process of an upgrade, I have to remember the state of what was there in the Azure auto-hosted app and then build from that. 
right? So I have to do some special upgrade configuration. Whereas if a provider wants to adapt, I can control C, control V, new code. You know, it's not a problem. Upgrading a .NET application is not that hard. You will also see that upgrading SharePoint hosted apps requires some special consideration because SharePoint hosted apps create a new SP web. So you have to go through an upgrade process to be able to, uh, and you have to consider the feature upgrade things that they introduced in SharePoint 2010. The documentation of those is woefully inaccurate, unfortunately. Right, and the blogs and the books on that are also quite inaccurate because everybody read from MSDN, right? So there are a lot of things to consider and a lot of things to learn when it comes to upgrading SharePoint hosted apps. Needless to say, upgrading SharePoint hosted apps is not that easy. It requires a special skill. Before we start looking into the code part of it, let's understand some golden rules about apps. <coughs> these are things that if somebody pinched you at 3 in the morning and asked you these golden rules, you should be absolutely clear about those as a SharePoint developer. Rule number one, SharePoint apps will never run any code on the SharePoint server. <clears throat> they can be served out of SharePoint, they can be downloaded from SharePoint, but they will never run any DLLs on the SharePoint server itself. That is rule number one. <clears throat> so the way it works is that they are served from a completely different URL. And that completely different URL could run code on the completely different URL, the other server. And whenever you wish to talk to SharePoint, you would go through this URL to the SharePoint server. Right? So you're always talking through your app in one way or another. Rule number two, apps are downloaded and installed, just like apps on our phones. Right? The first time I saw apps was from our phones. They can be downloaded from Marketplace. This is the Office catalog that they've set up. Second, you can set up such a catalog in-house, right, in your company. Third, you can also push them via API or PowerShell. The Office Marketplace has some significant limitations in the current web, but there are some interesting apps out there. Right, there's no subscription model. Like if I as a vendor, if I'm pushing something on the marketplace, then I have to, I don't have a relationship to the customer. I don't get reports on who downloaded my app. So I can, you know, when I'm in the enterprise space, these things are important. If I'm writing Flappy Bird, I don't care who installed it. But if I'm writing a big workflow or a forms product, then I care about who's installing it. Because maybe there's integration of the backend systems that I care about. But the good news is that I have the ability with SharePoint to set up a corporate catalog. They also call this app catalog. So when you install SharePoint on-premises, so SharePoint 2013 has got amazing multi-tenancy features. So SharePoint has got this thing in it called managed services. When you create a managed service, it doesn't set it up in a partition mode by default, but through PowerShell you have the ability to do that. And basically what that means is that you can create tenancies in your organization. So you can say that the finance department is their own tenancy, the HR department is their own tenancy, and they get their own app store, app catalog. They get their own unique app catalog, and the finance department gets their own app catalog, and so on and so forth. That is possible on premises, and that is exactly what they use in Office 365 also. When you sign up for Office 365, you get an Office 365 tenancy. It is possible to do that on premises also. So you can have one or more corporate catalogs. Now, when you install SharePoint, by default, you get one tenancy, which is farm wide. So you get one app catalog to play with. And the third, obviously, is that through PowerShell or the SharePoint API, you can also deploy apps. When I hit F5 in Visual Studio, it is going to use that. Rule number three in the user interface of SharePoint, they have started calling lists and document libraries apps. Those are not apps. Those are lists and document libraries. They've done that for the convenience of the end user. So the end user wants a discussion forum. To them, it's like an app. But behind the scenes, we're creating a list. So as techies, as SharePoint techies, we need to understand the difference between a list, document library, and an app. They are completely different. Rule number four. I've already mentioned this, but somehow to re-emphasize this, 
the apps never run from the same URL as the SharePoint site. And this is crucial to the security of SharePoint. So what that means is that if your SharePoint server is running at http intranet.mycompany.com, then apps cannot run from intranet.mycompany.com. They can run from apps.mycompany.com or mycompanyapps.com. But they cannot run from intranet.mycompany.com. Now, if you need the best practices on this, they'll basically tell you that you should not even share the subdomain. Like apps.mycompany.com is technically not 100% secure because some cookies are cross domain. So you can have some information leakage there. But I think that really depends on your usage. If you're okay with that level of risk, apps.mycompany.com is fine. Right? Features, which was the classic way of adding SharePoint functionality, could be installed on four different scopes. SP Web, SP Site, Web Application, and Farm. Apps are always installed at the SP Web. Now, this word install is a little overloaded, right? There are two things to consider in apps. Number one, making it available for install. And some documentation out there calls that part as installation. So I want to be, I want to be clear, when I say install, by that I mean the last step you go through before you start using the app. So when you go to the add an app you know, choice and you click and that is what I'm talking about. So when I put something in the app catalog, I'm, that I don't call that as installing the app. I call that as making it available for install. Okay, so that is different. That is done at a tenancy level or a farm level or something like that. When you actually use the app, you always use it at the SP web level. Okay, and where do you install the app? That SP web is called as the host web, and optionally, the process of installing the app can create an app web. Right? App web is optional. SharePoint hosted app will always have an app web. Provider hosted app or an auto hosted app may or may not have an app web. It depends on your needs. If you want to use a SharePoint list, then you need an app web. What you'll see is that if you want to use JavaScript API from your provider posted app, then also you will need an app web because your requests are routed through the app web. Right, so it depends on your needs. So again, where I install the app is called as a host web, then I may have an app web or I may have a provider hosted area depending upon the nature of my app. And sometimes apps need server-side code, and that code can be written in any technology, but you'll see that with .NET and Visual Studio, they give us this class for tokenhelper.cs that makes writing these apps a whole lot easier. Now, if you could write the tokenhelper.cs in Objective-C, then you could use apps on iOS also, but I'll tell you that writing the tokenhelper.cs is not the easiest thing to do. Right? It, that, that code is quite complicated. And such apps that have another server on the site are trusted inside of SharePoint using either OAuth-based trust or S2S trust. In the long run, I think you will see OAuth being invested a lot more than S2S. Right? All the things that are being released in Office 365, the new Office Developer API, it's relying on OAuth. S2S is, think of it as a stopgap measure for long purposes. So again, the golden rules over here, again, these should be very clear to us. Apps never run any code on the SharePoint server. They're downloaded and installed either from marketplace, corporate catalog, or the API. In the user interface, lists and document libraries are also called apps. Those are not apps. Apps never run from the same URL as the SharePoint site, but, and that is critical to the app's security model. So you could set up apps incorrectly also and break, uh, break SharePoint app security. You should do that, right? You should always run it from a different URL. Apps are installed on an SP web. That's called as a host web. You can optionally provision an app web. Apps sometimes need server-side code, and that server-side code is trusted inside of SharePoint with either OAuth or S2S trust. 
So with that, let's talk about kinds of apps one more time. As I mentioned, that you can categorize them either by user interface or how they are hosted. Right? The user interface is full screen, app card, or custom action, and how they are hosted is either there's no server side code or you have server side code. And if you have server side code, it's either auto hosted or provider hosted. And with that, let's get to some let's get some code and demos and see this working behind the scenes. Okay. So that's all the use I have for PowerPoint. <coughs> and uh, one, so we have approximately one hour, which is great. Okay, so let's come here. This is my SharePoint site. I'm going to go ahead and clean this page up a little. So I delete this. Delete this. So one, one thing about my demos is that whenever I give demos, these are not, a lot of them are not pre rehearsed and some things break. And that's how we know it's real. Okay, so some of the things may or may not work, but let's just try it out, and that's how we learn. So I'm going to go ahead and open Visual Studio, and I'm going to click on this new project button over here. Well, first I have to wait for Visual Studio to wake up. So give it a second. Right now, if I go to the SharePoint tab over here, you see that there is a link here on apps, and in here I have three choices. First is app for Office 2013. This is what we're not covering today. This is an app for the Office client. We're not talking about that. So I have two choices here. Cloud business app and an app for SharePoint 2013. A cloud business app is Lite Switch repackaged. Right? There used to be this product called Visual Studio Lite Switch, which was basically that uh, you know, if you're not a developer and you know you're using drag and drop, you want to create something useful. Okay, you can do that if you like it. My, my thought on that always was, you know, if you're a developer and if you install Visual Studio, you'll probably just skip like switch and go to the next step. So anyway, it's debatable whether that's taken off or not, but it's there. It's a choice. What Cloud Business App is useful for is, you know, if I want to create a good master details, editing UI or whatever using an app that uses some SharePoint data and maybe a SQL Azure database, it's pretty easy to do that in Cloud Business Apps, right? We'll cover that another day. Let's focus on this, App for SharePoint 2013. The first news I want to give you is that you don't need Visual Studio to write apps. If you are targeting Office 365 only, you can use something called as Napa. But you're going to target only Office 365 by doing that. So let's quickly look at that. I'm going to go to my Mac, and there's no Visual Studio here. And I'm going to go to HTTPS. WinSmartsDev.SharePoint.com. This is my Office 365 site. I'm going to go ahead and log in. Sign in. And Napa is an app that you can use to write apps. And I have already installed it. Maybe I've removed it. And it's, it's reset doesn't go away very easily. So. I can go to site contents over here, and you see that I've already installed it. If I had not installed it, I could you know, add an app, and then I could find it in the marketplace. So from my organization, or I can say apps I can add, and I can go to the SharePoint store, and over here I'll see some interesting apps that I can use. Right? I have to select the right language and everything. But I could potentially just you know find an app from there and just add it to my environment. I could do that. But you know I've already installed Napa, so I'm not gonna like reinstall it. So let me just go back to my Office 365 site and I'll just go ahead and run Napa. So I can click on this link over here, working on it. Any of you know that? If you click on that, it disappears. That's Twitter. That's a feature. And they have eight dots in there, and they spin in a clockwise direction. But if you go to Australia, it spins, it spins the other way. No, that's not true. Anyway, we gotta wait for that. <coughs> right. So it points me to the URL for NapaCloudApp.com. Looks like it's a provider hosted app they've created. I already have created an app inside here called SharePoint App. I could create a new project, and you see that it allows me to write. Both Office apps and SharePoint apps, and I can go to the SharePoint app over here that I've already written, and 
It's a beta product right now, so I have this feedback smiley over here. And you see over here that it's sort of like Visual Studio running in the cloud. And, and Napa is, is like, you know, every time I look at it, they've added new features inside of it. So I have, you know, pages inside of here, like default or ASPX, as you can see over here. Right? And I have scripts inside of here. And, you know, it's even got in, some, you know, basic intelligence. Like I can say, function, my tool function, okay? And it's got parenthesis completion, as you can see, and that's really nice to have in JavaScript. Like I wish Visual Studio did that, did that bit of a job of that. And then I can also say my who and see it's evaluating it on, on the fly. Right? So you see that it, it auto-completes it. So that's pretty cool. It's really nice when your JavaScript gets more and more complicated and also gives me some help and all of that, right? And then what I've done with this, I can just hit this play button and it would package up my app and it would install it. Napa gives me some basic capabilities to share the project with others also. But what it doesn't give me is all the power of Visual Studio. The biggest thing that's missing in here, among other things, is a good release strategy, like source control. There is no source control for Napa, right? So Napa is not what most of us will use. Napa is okay for a user, you know, like a small little one-time thing that you want to do. But if, you, if you're gonna write apps seriously, then you need Visual Studio. What Napa will allow you to do is that it will allow you to export the app from HTML, from, from Napa, to Visual Studio. And it's a one-time export that you can click a button, it turns it into a Visual Studio project, and then you can source control that. You cannot take a Visual Studio project and put it back into Napa. That's not possible. So let's close Napa and come back into Visual Studio. To write apps, if your target is Office 365 only, then you don't need a complicated SharePoint VM. But it's still going to you know, simplify your task a lot more if you have a proper SharePoint dev environment. So that's what I'm using. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and create a simple app. So just to save some time, I'm not going to bother renaming the app. I'll just go with default names and I'm going to hit OK. And <coughs> it's asking me a bunch of questions. It says, what SharePoint site do you want to use for debugging your app? And you know what? This could have been Office 365. I could debug it right from here. But for now, I'm just going to target my local SharePoint environment, which is HTTP HTTPSP. Then it's asking me, how do I want to post my app? And there are three choices. Provider hosted, auto hosted, or SharePoint hosted. I already talked about these. We'll look at these other options as well. But let's keep it simple. Let's start with SharePoint hosted first. Click on the finish button, and uh, progress bar runs, and it'll basically create the basic structure of the SharePoint app for me. Now this is a SharePoint hosted app. So when the project gets completed, uh, I will have only one project in my solution. Right? I will have only one project in my solution. If it was a provider hosted app, I would have two projects in the solution. So I see a project over here, and it's got various nodes in it, content, images, pages, scripts, but every app project will have something called as appmanifest.xml. An appmanifest.xml is what tells SharePoint what is this app all about, right? So the fact that it is a SharePoint hosted app, that information is embedded inside of appmanifest.xml. The fact that this app is asking for read or write permission or whatever permission is asking for is embedded in appmanifest.xml. The fact that you can say, to install this app, you must have this feature enabled, right? Prerequisites for the app. That information can be embedded inside of appmanifest.xml, among other things. So if I double click on this app manifest.xml, it opens this nice little designer that allows me to work with this. But really it's just an XML file, so I can right click on it, choose view code, and it shows you the structure. And, and you know, a couple of interesting things start jumping up at me as I, as I start looking at this. One thing you see over here is got something called a SharePoint pin version, which basically says that my app requires a certain minimum version of SharePoint to work on. Now, you'll see that in Office 365, this is a little bit more challenging because the min version doesn't change, 
but the JavaScript libraries keep changing. And if I'm writing a product, then if it's installed on three customers, one customer gets a new version today, another customer may not get the same version a month later. But that might break my app. Okay, to solve that need, you see that there is something called a standard tokens being passed to you. This is a query string, it gets replaced with four things. Post web URL, app web URL, uh, JavaScript like a library version and language. Right? So it sort of sets up context for you. And you know, there are a bunch of other tokens you can pass over here as well. If you just go to my site, winsmarts.com, and search for SharePoint tokens, you'll find a list of all the tokens that are available for you. Another thing you see over here is version of the app. So I wish I could be the guy who could just write code and forget about it. It never happens, right? So the code is like sex. One mistake and you'll repeat it for the rest of your life. So frequently what happens is that you know, you may have pushed a bug and you may want to push an update. Or users ask for new features. The process of pushing an update of an app is that you would bump up the version number and then upload the app into the app catalog again. And now SharePoint has got enough smarts that once every 24 hours or so, a timer job will run and it will inform the user that an update is available. It will not install it automatically. Now through PowerShell you have the ability to push an update also, right? But that is something that the administrator can do. But for the user, the user is always in control. If they don't want a new version, it's not going to get installed automatically. Now, the user could ask for an update, and in that case, you can use feature upgrade scenarios, etc., to upgrade a SharePoint app. Wait a minute. I thought I was writing a SharePoint app. What the hell does that have to do with a feature? Feature or solution packages, right? We'll get to that in a second. But you see over here, another thing you see here is this tilde app web URL. And at the bottom, you see app principle internal. You will see that in SharePoint hosted apps. When in SharePoint hosted apps, it is the user's identity, internal principle, that is being used to see whether you have access or not to a resource that the app is trying to access. It is still app plus user security, right? So the app doesn't have access to do something, then the request is going to fail. But the important distinction over here is that the SharePoint hosted app is in the same web application as SharePoint itself. So your authentication to the SharePoint hosted app is the same authentication that SharePoint used. In other words, you're using an internal app principle reliant on SAML tokens. Right? Whereas in provider hosted apps, you're using the user's identity, but that identity was not issued by SharePoint. It was issued by the provider hosted app. Plus, you're using a token-based identity that's called as an access token, which encapsulates the user's identity and the app's identity. And optionally, it could be only the app identity. <coughs> so, lesson learned, takeaway. App-only identity, which is very useful, because it allows you to do impersonation or elevation, right? Where I don't have access to write to a list, but through the app I can, right? That facility is available only in provider hosted apps. It is not available in SharePoint hosted apps. Why would that be useful? Imagine if I was writing a timesheet application in which I don't have the rights to approve, but I have the rights to submit, okay? So let's say I submit and then, oh, but we want to build in a rule in which you say that once I've submitted, I cannot unsubmit. That's it, right? So in order to submit, I have to write to a list, which means I need a right access to that list. But if I have right access to that list, and if I'm a crafty hacker, I could write some clever JavaScript and I could unsubmit also, right? That's what we want to try and prevent. So through app-only permission, I can submit to that list through the app. Okay? And another thing that, that it's a segue to this is that 
when I'm submitting, I shouldn't be able to change that submission logic either, right? Like I should have just F12 on the browser and change the JavaScript and do whatever the hell I want. So takeaway number two, app only permission, which is provider has to apps only, but takeaway number two is that app only permission works server side only. It is not exposed in JavaScript. You cannot do app only permissions using JavaScript. Clear? Okay, let's come back to SharePoint hosted apps. So I have a simple app written over here. Let's examine the logic of that. Now, you can write the app in whatever language you wish, but if you're starting within SharePoint, it is ASP.NET. It is, it is a SharePoint page, in fact. And the logic that you're writing is written in JavaScript. You could use Silverlight or something like that also, but mostly we're going to use JavaScript. So what am I doing in this app? It gives me some starter code, which is good enough for me to get started. You see that it inherits from Microsoft or SharePoint or web pages or web part page. Hey, this is a SharePoint page. Because this app is going to run in an app web, it is a SharePoint page, which also means the branding is not a headache. It's gonna you know, just adopt SharePoint's look and feel without any extra work. Now you'll see that when I write provider hosted apps, it's gonna take some work for me to adopt that look and feel. Because that is ASP.NET. It doesn't understand the SharePoint master page, right? So I have to do some extra work over there. But see, this is a web part page. I'm gonna scroll to the right over here. And blah, blah, blah. And it's using the SharePoint master page too. Because you'll see that this app web that gets created is actually a subsite of the same site collection where the host web is. So it adopts that same look and feel. And it says language C-sharp. But you know what? If I was to put any inline code inside of here, I'll get an error. You know, like I said, uh, script run at is equal to server. I cannot do that in this page. I could do it, it'll try and deploy it, but it'll, it'll fail. Now, let me ask you this. What if, what if I didn't do, uh, you know, inline code, but ahead of time, I wrote a DLL as a farm solution and I deployed that farm solution, and over here I said inherits that other thing that got deployed as a farm solution. That the code behind is a separate DLL that got deployed as a farm solution. In other words, I'm trying to muscle my way in and trying to get custom code into the server. So there is no inline code here, but I separated the inline code as a farm solution. That will also not work. There is no way you can put server-side code using SharePoint hosted apps. What else are we doing in here? We're referencing a couple of JavaScript files. jQuery 1.9.1. So we're using jQuery. Okay? We're using spruntime.js and sp.js, which gives me access to the client side object model. So that's good. <coughs> and we are, uh, let's see, what else are we doing? We're referencing slash content slash app.css, which happens to be in my project over here. If I go to content, there's a file here called app.css. Right next to the elements.xml. Again, that was supposed to be for solution packages. Anyway, let's come back here. And there's an app.js, which also is over here. And there are a bunch of other files inside of here, including jQuery. And also there's an elements.xml here. Now I'm getting a little curious. Let's look at that elements.xml. It looks like a module tag. Again, I thought modules had to do with features. What is that doing in an app? Let's get to that in a second. And inside of the app.js, there's some code that uses CSOM and writes something to this message paragraph up here. Okay? Let's go look at that app.js code. The app.js code gets the SharePoint client context, okay? And then it gets the client context, it says context.load user, context.execute query async. Right, this is the client side object model. I'm gonna talk about this in detail in my next talk, but this is a CSOM, right? 
The same seesaw we've been writing in SharePoint 2010 has been greatly expanded in SharePoint 2013. So if you can write seesaw code, which actually is pretty easy, you can get the username over here and basically you say hello and the name of the user. So when this app runs, it should say hello administrator. Right? It's pretty simple. Let's go ahead and deploy this through Visual Studio first. And before I deploy this, I'm going to say debug Windows output. So we can see what happens behind the scenes when I hit this play button. And it's going to try it and deploy it. Installation is in progress, zero work. So whenever I do this, when I play this little game, I say, how many seconds before it will get installed? So whoever gets the closest number wins. Any guess it? Ah, too late. What oh, is it, 10 seconds or so? Anyway. So it's asking for my username and password. This is strange because why didn't it single sign me in? It single signs me into HTTPSP, but it's asking for a username and password. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and type in my username and password. And okay, seems like my app is working. Now, while the app is working, I can you know go back over here. I see the app is over here. I can go to site contents, and I can see that the app got installed. I can click this ellipsis, find details about the app, details, permissions, remove. And you know what? If there was a new update available, I'll see a choice to update right here as well. So in development scenarios, like you know, you don't want to wait 24 hours for to test your update. You'll see the update link appear here as well. And there is this link called permissions, and this is. Let's click on that. Let's see what, what I get here. There's a link here to be able to trust the app again. And this requires you know, special consideration because what happens is that when the app got installed, right? Visual Studio did this for me, but I would have gotten a trust dialog. And when I click go ahead trust this app, a new app principle would have been created inside of the host web. I'm in the host web right now. And let's say I had an object, an SP securable object on which permission inheritance was broken. And then that app principle would have gotten rights over there as well. But what happens is that when you delete an object, it goes into recycle bin and the permissions go with it. And then when you restore it, whatever was in the recycle bin comes back. So imagine if the scenario was that I have an item on which permissions are broken and I delete it. It goes into the recycle bin. Okay? And now I install an app and then I restore this item. This restored item will not have the permissions. That they usually I think it should have the permissions, but it doesn't. And in that case, I would have to retrust the app. And the flip is also true. Like you know, if I gave an app principle permissions and the item was there. And then I delete the item, uninstall the app, then I restore the item, guess what? The app principle is still there. Right? So you have to keep that in mind. Anyway, let's come back to my SharePoint hosted app, and I'm going to look at the URL of my SharePoint hosted app. Wow, it looks pretty long. Compared to the URL of my SharePoint site. Right? Let me increase the font size here a little bit. Okay. So, looks like it's in a completely different URL suffix. Right? It's in a completely different domain. And this, remember I was saying that SharePoint apps never run from the same URL as SharePoint itself. So, you see over here that my SharePoint is running from HTTPSP and my app is running from this weird looking URL slash SharePoint app one slash something something. And in front of that, I have these query strings, SP host URL, SP language, SP client tag, product number, SP app web URL, and that's it. So this was that standard tokens that get passed into anything that has an app web, <coughs> right? This basically allows me to uh, hey, know that you have to be running on a certain product number to be able to use my app. Right? You have to, this app is written for English only, and so on and so forth. Right? I can build that logic now. So get rid of these query strings. Let's focus on only this URL up here for now. So the interesting thing is that this URL looks like something dash a weird number dot something. Right? 
this is my app domain, this is my app prefix, and this is a number, it's a hex number, that increases any time any user installs a new app. So if I was to uninstall this app and reinstall it, that will become F3, F4, F5, and so on and so forth. So what's happening over here is that any time any user installs the app, you know, a new DNS is created for me. A new URL is created for me. And, and, and the challenge with that is that any time a new URL is created for me, if I HTTP to that URL, how does that URL get resolved? Because it is running out of the same SharePoint app server. So I'm going to take this URL, I'm going to open DOS prompt, and I'm going to ping this URL. And it seems to be going to a server IP address called 172. Dot sixteen dot eight dot one fifty four. I don't recognize this IP. What is my IP address? This machine IP config one seventy two dot sixteen dot eight dot one fifty four. Wait a minute. It is the same IP address. So anytime I HTTP to so something like this, if I go to you know ping uh, Lady Gaga dot apps.ws.int it's the same IP address right ping katieperry.apps.ws.int it's the same IP address ping justin bieber.apps.ws.int so you see all these ladies resolve to the same URL right so what's happening over here is that I have set up a wildcard DNS entry so if I go over here, click on Administrative Tools, click on DNS, it's somewhere over here, right there. I click on DNS, you see that I've created a forward lookup zone, you'll have to do this on your dev machine and you'll have to do this in production. So over here under apps.ws.int, I created a star CDM record, and the star CDM record is basically repointing back to this machine. Now let me give you a dev environment tip. So you see it's pointing to the same machine over here. So browse and not pointing to the same machine. Let me give you a dev environment tip. You'll see here that if I type IP config, I have two network cards on this machine. One of them, I always keep it on a static IP address like this, 192.168.137.128. And I repoint that app's URL to that IP address. And this is dev environment only. And the reason I do that is because my dev environment, I'm taking it from hotel to airplane to airport to machine to office to conference. The IP address is changing all the time. Right? And I want my app's environment to just work wherever I go. So I create two DNS, two network cards, one static IP, one dynamic IP. The dynamic IP is what I do my internet surfing on. And the static IP is what the app's URL points to. And the advantage I get with that is that if I don't have a DNS, or if somehow the, over here the DNS is messing up my environment, my app's infrastructure still continues to work. Right? So that's a dev environment component. You're not going to need that in production. But right? dev, it's invaluable. So anyway, this is my app still installed, still working. Let's go ahead and open PowerShell, SharePoint 2013 Management Shell. I'm going to increase the font size a little bit here so we can read it. I don't know about you guys, but if I was looking all the way back, then I could read the screen. So hopefully this is better. Properties. This is a nice font. Like that. Okay. So now I'm going to say dollar web is equal to get SP web HTTP SP. So this is my host web. Okay? So I should have dollar web over here. Yeah, I do. Dollar web dot site. This should give me my site collection. And then I can say all webs. What? I have two SP webs in the site collection. And one of them is actually the app web. Right? So this tells me that the app web is nothing but an SP web. So you know what? If I go into my site over here, and if I go into site contents, and if I scroll down slowly, under subsites, maybe I'll see the app web, but I don't. Because that app web is hidden from the user. 
right? It's not like any other app web. It is in fact on a completely different URL. So I'm going to say dollar app web is equal to um, let's see dollar web dot sites dot all webs and the first one. Excuse me, did I mistake this? Sites. Okay. Dollar app web. Let me just make sure I got it. Yes. So dollar app app web. So, okay, I got the app web. I'm going to say, well, what folders are there in this app web? So I'm going to say dollar app web dot folders. Oh boy, that's too much. So I'm going to say ft URL, which basically tells me, you know, just one property of those. And it tells me that my app web, which actually I can see in SharePoint Designer also, that my app web has got the following folders. Lists, images, private, catalog, scripts, you know, blah, 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 okay? But let's remember this, it's got lists, images, scripts, content pages. 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 If I come back into my SharePoint solution, I see content, images, pages, scripts. Lists there in every SharePoint site. So that's uncanny that I have the same folders in the app web as I had in my solution. Isn't that weird? Now let's go dive, dive into the scripts folder. So the scripts one is like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so I'm going to say folders 4. I'm going to say uh, dollar scripts is equal to this. Dollar scripts dot URL. Okay, I got the right folder. Dollar scripts dot files. Hey, it's the same files. Isn't that weird? Look at this. It's the same files. The references dot is for Visual Studio only. But you see, jQuery, app.js, what's going on? Now let's look at the elements.xml. And the elements.xml is sticking the same files that I see here are the ones I see here. So somehow it looks like that my elements.xml is responsible for sticking in those files into the content database. How exactly is this working? All right, now I'm curious. I'm going to stop debugging for a second and I'm going to package the app. So the process of packaging the app is how you would make the app available to the marketplace or, or you know, your app catalog. So now that I've uninstalled the app, you know, stopping debugging will remove the app. When this reset doesn't go away, that quickly, but actually, let's see. I have stopped debugging, haven't I? Debug stop. Well, it didn't remove it for some reason. Let's see, why didn't it remove it? Because it's a piece of crap. I'm just going to manually remove it. It might bomb now because I think I know what's going on. No, it removed it. Okay. Uh, memory also. Let me just quickly create some memory. You, you don't have to do this all the time. This is my standard SharePoint Dev VM. I'm just gonna while I'm talking, I'm just gonna quickly create some memory on my environment also. Anyway, so that is central administration warming up. I'm gonna quickly create some memory. But you see here that. My next step is to make this app available for everybody to install and use. So I'm going to right click on my project, I'm going to choose publish, I click on publish, <coughs> and I'm going to choose to package this app. I'm going to click this button and it's going to package up the app as a dot app file. Okay? So pardon me just for a second, I'm just going to quickly create some memory. Manage services on the SharePoint server, manage service applications, and I'm going to stop distributed cache. I'm going to leave the search service application. And this should give me about 5, 6 gigabytes back. So start class manager. This is 11 point something gigs. It should come down to about 7.5 in a second. Okay, let's come back here. So I went ahead and packaged the app. Let me go back to the app. I'm going to rename this as, actually, that's control C, control V. I'm going to rename this to dot zip. And if I open this, it's a zip file. And it looks like the format that Office documents are in, right? And inside of it, there's a, there's a WSP. Oh, 
okay, this looks like a standard WSP. Let's see what's inside the WSP. So you know, WSP is just a cap file. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to rename this to .cap, and I open this. Wow, this is a standard WSP. I'm going to go ahead and sort this by path. Right? There's a manifest.xml, there's a features.xml. This is a standard SharePoint sandbox solution. So you see, sandbox solutions are not deprecated. Now there is no DLL inside of it, okay? It's just camel code. So if you see here that this feature.xml, and actually you know you can package this up right over here. There's a features tab, there's a package tab. If I double click on features, you'll see that I have all the modules added inside of here. Inside of the package, I have, you know, this stuff here. That's pretty cool. So let me ask you this. Could I write a feature receiver on this feature? How many people say yes? It's just a feature. I should be able to write a feature receiver. How many people say yes? And how many people say no? Why not? Because server-side code. Feature receiver would be server-side code, right? We cannot have any server-side code, absolutely. But you know what you can do? You can come down here, and there are these events that you can tap. App installed, installing, upgraded, which will call a web service on another server. So they give you the equivalent of that. But, but see, th th there's an issue here. Now you are dealing with a provider hosted app. Okay, even though it's a SharePoint hosted app, but you have another server on the site. It's like a provider hosted app. And the challenge that creates is that for me to be able to upgrade my SharePoint hosted app, I have to have the provider hosted web anyway, so why not just go with the provider hosted app? Right? There are some other disadvantages of SharePoint hosted apps also. The biggest disadvantage is it will not work with any kind of authentication other than classic windows, plain windows. It won't work with ADFS, it won't work with FDA, it won't work with anything else. The reason for that is that when it does a redirect back to you, right? When the STS does a redirect back to you, you cannot register a wildcard rel in an STS. But your app's URL is wildcard. It is star.apps.ws.int. STSs don't like that. So SharePoint posted apps will not work with anything except Windows authentication. And that is a big limitation. Now earlier I said something else. It said provider hosted apps, if you want to use client-side JavaScript, you have to have an app web. And that also means that if you intend to use client-side JavaScript, you're stuck with Windows app, uh, Windows authentication, unless you use OAuth. With OAuth, you don't have any of these limitations, because OAuth trusts in a completely different manner. Right? But you see that there is various things that you have to keep in mind. So App Story has a lot of fine print in it. Right? It has a lot of fine print in it. Tomorrow in my postcard, I'm going to go through the details of that. In my training, I'm also going to the details of these. We don't have enough time for all of that. But you see over here that I have this thing over here, and I package the app. So I'm going to do one more thing, and then we'll call it a day for now, which is I'm going to take this app, and I'm going to show the process of installing this app. No, no, no. Making it available for install, and then installing it. Okay? So to do that, I'm going to go to, see, I should have, I should have more memory now. So I'm going to go to central administration. And inside of central administration, under the apps section, manage app catalog, and you see that I've already created an app catalog. This is something you have to create. But I've already created it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to visit this URL. And here, I'm going to make my app available for use. So I'm going to say new app. And this app that I had packaged, which I forgot where I put it. So let's find it again. Open folder, bin, debug, app publish, .o, and it's right there. Okay, so I'm going to upload that inside of SharePoint. Browse, upload right there, click open, click OK, and it's going to upload it. And since this shouldn't take long, which we know is a lie, and I'm going to hit save. Right? And now it's available for use. Available for install. 
not use. In order to use it, I have to install it. I'm going to come here and I'm going to say site content. I'm going to say add an app. And you see that it says apps you can add. SharePoint app one. So now it's available for install. Now I can install it. Right? I can click on this. Now I have to trust it. Now the user granting the trust has to have the rights that the app is asking for. So if I didn't have right access and the app was asking for right access, I could not install it. But, but in this app, I didn't ask for any specific permissions, right? But still, every app gets this basic level of permission, basic information about users in the site. Every app gets these rights. What is basic information? Your basic minimal profile. First name, last name, manager info, email, phone, and a couple of other properties. So imagine that if I was a sneaky vendor, and I created this amazing app that showed you funny cat videos from YouTube, and I put it on the open marketplace, and of course this enhances productivity of your employees, so somebody's going to install it. Soon as you install it, I, I can access that basic info. Even if I didn't ask for any info, I have access to that info. I also have access to the list of lists in your site. I cannot read those lists, but I know what lists you have. Right? Similarly, if I have right access to your site, then I cannot, you cannot say that uh, I have right access to weather list, but not the announcements list. Well, actually, you can say that you have access to a certain list template. Right? That lets you go to that level. But then you can specify only one list template type. You can't say that you have access to both info path and document libraries. It's either just info path, just document libraries, or the entire site. So there are some limitations. Okay, there's a lot of fine print that we have to know about. But you know what? I trust this app. I'm going to hit OK. It's adding it. Install. Click on it. Now I like to you know, keep my app domain not in my intranet zone for dev purposes because then I know what request came from where. Right? Otherwise it gets very hard to tell. Everything was SSO that I can't tell. So I was asking me for a logout which means that it went to the other site that is not in my intranet zone. So I'm going to go ahead and add my credentials and it will run just like before. Bam. And this is my app running, working, happily. Okay, so this is a quick case test introduction into the SharePoint app model. There's obviously a lot more to learn about this, we'll cover that in the workshop tomorrow. But I'd love to take any questions at this point. Anybody learn anything new about apps today? How many of us have started looking at apps? Okay, but start looking at it in this many impressive point of view. Going forward, we'll be writing a lot of apps for sure. And the question you were asking only about HTML5, that would have to be a provider hosted app. You could not do that with a SharePoint hosted app. I'm keen to write apps so that it's a web app rather than taking that. Absolutely. What you do is that you come in here and you say right click, add, new item, and then you choose to add a client web part, and then you can surface up an ASPX as a web part, and basically it's a glorified iframe. But in the user interface, it looks like a web part. You know, obviously, there's fine print over there. Uh, how do you resize the, the, the client web part? How do you create deep links in it? What part security? Can the outside page look into that web part? Can the web part communicate with outside? There's a lot of things to consider over there. Right? So there's some fine print over there, but that's how you would do that. There's something to learn over there, but yes, that's how you can do that. And then make it service as an app. Yep. Just that's the same. Yeah, absolutely. Can you have that so it appears that with a really custom web class you can drop it into? Page. It appears right here. Let me show you. We hit page, edit, yeah. insert, web part, under apps, it'll appear right here. Okay. Cool. Alright, so I'm going to hang around for lunch and I have another session after lunch which is about Seesaw and REST API. Uh, my contact information is on my slides. My name is Samir Malik. I do in-house trainings or open courses and consulting. And I look forward to hearing from you. Hopefully you like the session, learn something new out of it.
Thank you.